expressions as subtle, daily, and often subconscious behaviors or comments that communicate a bias against others, especially an underrepresented group. Right? Now, it's important to note the impact of microaggressions grows over time, right? And, and, and it's, it's important to note, too, that there are distinct differences between uh, what we would call a microaggression, what we would call, um, you know, outright uh, discrimination, right? I mean, that's a very different sort of sort of uh, situation, uh, and 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 of course, what what we may simply consider just something that maybe was done in poor taste. Now, typically, with microaggressions, the way to think about them, you know, is is or rather, it's important to know that a lot of people they hear microaggressions and they kind of think like, oh well. You know, the word micros in it, it can't be that bad, right? I mean, micro sounds small, it sounds insignificant. Uh, and that is actually the point, right? They are small aggressions. Uh, but to that, we typically would, would respond with this, this um, proverb, I believe it's from Southeast Asia, um, that uh, we have heard before, which is very, very useful to think about with microaggressions, which is, if you think you're too small to have an impact, try going to bed with a mosquito in the room, right? And that's really what microaggressions are like. And it's kind of like having a constant mosquito bite, right? But as opposed to having a mosquito bite once a week uh, or even daily, you're, you're getting the mosquito bite hourly, right? Uh, and it starts to, eventually, it starts to become a real problem. Eventually, it starts to become a real challenge for you and, and, and a massive distraction, right? Uh, especially in the workplace, in the place where you're there to, to concentrate, to work, to give your best uh, to give the best version of yourself, right, uh, for your colleagues. Now, the, the impacts of microaggressions, you can see them here on the screen, right? So we're talking about lower levels of engagement, decreased retention, et cetera. And these make sense, right? These make sense because typically, uh, typically uh, we would want, um, sorry, I got distracted there for a second, my bad. <laughs> Um, oh, and I have one person writing in, by the way, that they're not hearing anything. Uh, so I'm not sure if anyone else is unable to hear me. I'm assuming that folks are, um, but we'll reach out to Jessica specifically and, and see about um, her, her her connection. But anyway, back to back to the impact of microaggressions. Uh, okay, some people are confirming audio is okay. Uh, so back to the impact of microaggressions. It stands to reason that if something is going on that is constant. Right, and that may be small, but the impact of it is significant because the subject matter behind it is significant. Um, then, yeah, eventually you are going to be distracted, or you are going to feel like, hey, you know what? The people who I work with, they don't value me, right? So we define inclusion uh, as uh, making others feel valued, welcomed, and respected. So if if a person is a constant victim of microaggressions, that valuing, that respect, right, that goes out the window. And you, you don't, most people typically don't want to work for a place where they do not feel valued, where they do not feel respected, right? And that, that's really what it, what it boils down to. Um, so how do you identify a microaggression? We're going to give you some examples in just a minute, but the way to identify microaggressions is pretty straightforward, right? So the first one is frequency. I kind of use that example with the mosquito. Another example that Natalie and I like to use sometimes is paper cuts, right? Uh, one paper cut is not that bad, but once you have 50 paper cuts, 100 paper cuts, it starts to get very painful, right? Uh, but frequency uh, is, is certainly one of them. Usually microaggressions come often. Uh, delivery. Uh, typically, they come in the, in the shape of a, of a, of a I was in the shape of a box because I'm staring at the image. Typically, they come in the, in the shape of a, in the form of a joke. Right. Uh, so typically people are joking around, they'll say something and then you realize, like, oh, you know, that's a little bit, it's a little bit rude. Um, awareness. Right. So so what we're talking about there is is, is, is is the person may not be aware of the fact of what they're doing. Right. The person committing the microaggression may not realize. And we're going to talk a little bit later about the difference between intent and impact, uh, the meaning. Right. So so. Like this is what separates a microaggression from someone that's just being rude. Uh, microaggressions typically are speaking to more significant underlying issues um, that are maybe beneath the surface and typically are linked up with specific stereotypes or specific biases, right? So the meaning behind them is, is particularly powerful. Uh, and then the direction, right? So who is the microaggression aimed at? That's very linked up with the meaning, right? Again, it has to do with 
what is sort of unsaid, right? What biases are at play here? That's really what drives it. And it's what separates a microaggression from, uh, again, just, just being rude, right? I mean, they're, they're not, not every rude statement is a microaggression, but every microaggression is essentially a rude statement, um, right? So those are really the ways to, to distinguish uh, microaggressions. Now, what we wanted to do was we actually wanted to ask some of you what microaggressions you may have experienced or you either either personally directed at you or directed at someone else uh, in your presence or that you've been made aware of. But what are some typical microaggressions that you may have uh, seen out in, in the real world, in the professional world, or even uh, outside of it? And I'll, uh, I'll read out some comments here as they, as they come in. Okay. Uh, so I've got a few here. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a big one. Uh, so one person writing in um, women uh, being being cold or being treated as, as being more emotional, uh, touching uh, black women's hair. Uh, there's there's a we're going to talk about this in a bit. Um, but and by the way, it looks like this person got their audio back. So that's good. Uh, but uh, we're going to talk about this in a bit. But there's there's a lot about um, there's a lot about the policing, so to speak, of black people's hair that, that really just sort of comes up. Um, switching language when I enter a room, even though I speak the local language. So I'm assuming there's a little bit of context there. For instance, the person may um, be living in a foreign country. Uh, everyone knows the language that this person speaks. The person speaks the language of that other country. However, when this person walks into the room, they switch into that person's native language. Um, so there's an unspoken element there of, of sort of implying the person doesn't really speak the language. Um, okay, fair enough. Uh, being asked, what's your real name? Um, as a black person, uh, and by the way, I can say this too as someone who's foreign, I get this all the time, um, being uh, someone saying to you, you speak English so well, or you speak so well, or you sound so educated, right? Uh, saying a mother should be home with her children, using the word manpower versus people power, uh, absolutely. Uh, that's that's a big one. I, I, there's a lot of of situations where we use the word man as a as a as a shortened version of actually trying to say person or human. Um, so I am head of sales here at W3, and of course, salesman is a term that people throw around all the time. Um, salesperson, of course, is is would be the more accurate description. Uh, but yes, absolutely, someone being asked where are you from, right? Based on their their ethnicity. Um, so it needs a little bit more context, I think, but having an aggressive tone during a whole meeting. So that there's a lot of context behind that. I think it depends on who it's being directed at and sort of what's going on, um, because there is something to be said of maybe direct communicators who maybe just sound aggressive um, and may not intend to. So so I think there's a little bit of unpacking with that statement that, that, that would have to take place. But I, I understand where that's coming from. Um, so yeah, look, these are all fantastic example so we threw up a few here and I'm gonna go um, I'm gonna go through them in in just a minute um, right and we'll we'll, we'll sort of um, go through each one of these so the first one that we have and this this one's very similar to one of the very first ones that we we received from from all of you um, was where you had mentioned someone had mentioned right a woman being told that she's too emotional this was very similar so telling your black female colleague, she's too angry all the time uh so why is that I mean, first of all that's just rude um right and i always say to people and we're going to get into into um ways to overcome microaggressions in in just a few moments but i always say to people the easiest way to do it is just don't be rude um right i said before that every microaggression is essentially a rude statement uh so if you stop yourself from doing that it's like half the battle but um uh, telling your black female colleague that she's too angry all the time why is that a microaggression? One, chances are that this colleague has heard it before because there is a stereotype out there that black female colleagues or black women um, are angry, right? There, there's at least at least in the United States, right? I can't speak to other countries on this one because uh, it may not be a global one, but at least to the United States, that is very much a stereotype that exists. And so therefore, every time that a woman, uh, a black woman acts, angry or is angry right the stereotype comes roaring back into people's minds and so they'll 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 describe that person as angry even though someone else who was from a different background who had the same levels of anger 
at roughly the same moments would not be described as being angry, right? That That's what sort of is distinguishing it, right? When we talked about uh, the meaning behind it and the directionality behind the microaggression, that's sort of what's driving it. This is one, the second one is one that happens all the time. We all do it. Um, we actually have a new course coming out, by the way, at RW3 on neurodiversity. It's gonna be released within the next couple of months. Um, so if you're interested in that, also let me know in the comments. But it, it, we, we sort of drew from, from just thinking about that course for this one, someone saying, so, and by the way, someone is, is writing in, and they're absolutely correct, uh, for the previous one about the black uh, colleague um, saying, clarifying that it's not just black women, it's black people in, period, in general. That's absolutely correct. So I should have been clear. It's not just black women. We use that example here uh, because women kind of get it on both sides. Um, because it's also just women in general can also be looked at as emotional, um, right? That's the other stereotype. But yes, absolutely. It's... it's um, it's uh, black people in general tend to have that stereotype directed against them. Against them. Now, this next one, right? Someone's saying, "Sorry, uh, I just had an OCD moment." Uh, right. So basically, when, when someone is um, uh, too tidy, right, or, or 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 is 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 very fixated on everything being done completely correctly, that sort of thing, the person may say, "Sorry, I'm just being OCD." Um, right, is there, the, it gets thrown around all the time. So maybe someone can also. Uh, sometimes you'll also hear someone saying, like, "Oh, I'm just being ADD when they're not paying attention." Right. So that all of these things, uh, what you're really doing is you're actually kind of minimizing uh, very specific medical conditions that some people have and suffer from and, and have to deal with to just make a point about maybe a silly behavior that you have. OCD, someone's asking, I should clarify, is obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, so it is a, a, a neurodiversity that, um, and maybe Natalie can explain it better, right? But basically they're, they're, everything sort of needs to be in its proper place, um, right? Otherwise the person has a very hard time um, functioning, right? And moving forward with their day. It's, it's a, it can be a very debilitating thing, but sometimes people use it as a punchline, as a joke, um, when they're just being a little bit too organized, right? Which is not really what it is. Uh, the next one, this has happened to me before even, right? Where someone asks, are you legal here? Uh, so I was born in another country. I was born in Peru. Uh, but once uh, when a colleague learned that the person made a joke saying, wait, you are legal here, right? And clearly it was intended as a joke. They didn't mean any harm by it. So I understood that. But I still called it out and said, eh, you know, that's not, that's not funny. I don't like that joke. And that was the end of that, that conversation. But folks who are born in foreign countries will typically receive this microaggression. And again, it is, it's a joke that people just make. Uh, it's, it's, it's just one of those things, but it's, it's not really one. It's not a very original joke. And secondly, it, it does make a lot of implications about that individual that really aren't particularly fair. The next one, this is one that, you know, we, we and by the way, we use a few examples here uh, that were more racialized than we typically would for these webinars. And that's mostly because uh, in the US at least, uh, folks here are, are, are uh, observing uh, Black History Month, right? And so we wanted to sort of touch that um, as well a little bit and just raise a little bit of awareness about some of the specific challenges uh, that, that, that people uh, are facing uh, that are more racialized in nature. So this next one, again, goes back to that uh, topic. And are you legal here is also racialized, by the way. Um, I guess the board needed a black guy, right? So it's something that someone would say uh, or at least think, but but we're focusing more on, on behavior here, uh, right? Something that someone would say uh, or act upon even when they see that a black person has been promoted uh, to a high level, right? And there's a lot that, that has to do with, with a lot of organizations um, looking at increasing representation at higher levels within the board and that sort of thing. And so one of the reactions uh, that we have, you know, that that is out there, right? And you do hear people vocalize is they're saying like, oh, this person just got promoted because they're black or because they are brown or because they're Asian or whatever it is, uh, right? And so that, or because they're, they're, they're female. Um, so that's, Again, huge microaggression, right? Unless it, it, you have to assume that if someone gets promoted, it's because they deserve that position, right? Um, so it's it's very important to to, to make that point. Uh, the next one, again, this one is typically uh, typically uh, racialized as well, although it's not quite as overt. 
right? If someone's at a good school or a good university, and this again for non-US folks, a little bit of context, US universities uh, are very expensive and they uh, give scholarships for lots of reasons, academic reasons, but also um, and primarily, I think in a lot of schools, a lot of universities for uh, athletic reasons, right? So if you're very good at sports, they give you a, uh, a scholarship so you can play for the school and you don't have to pay, you don't have to pay tuition or you don't have to pay as much tuition. Uh, I think it really depends on how much money you need and how good you are at the sport, right? But one of the uh, very common microaggression that you see in a lot of university campuses or even with graduates, people will ask, oh, did you get here on an athletic scholarship? Right. Uh, and the reason why I say it's racialized is because you typically, uh, if you see a white male, uh, you don't, that's not your assumption as to how they got into the university, right? No one's going to sit there and say, oh, he must have gotten here um, on an athletic scholarship. That's not a stereotype that exists. Uh, if you see a black male, however, there is a stereotype like, oh, you know, he must be on the football team or the basketball team or whatever team. Um, and so therefore they got here an athletic scholarship, right? So basically, if you're asking that question, you are questioning why that person, that you are questioning the fact that that person belongs at that university for academic purposes. And lastly, and this is one that was mentioned, can I touch your hair, right? So there's a lot of policing and a lot of, um, uh, a lot of honestly ignorance around um, black people's hair in particular, right? Um, and by the way, uh, one person is just, I want to return to this, this comment here on, um, this is something I didn't know, uh, uh, on, um, did you get in on an athletic, on an athletic scholarship? Someone's writing in saying that it's actually a reason for why in the U S at least many, um, student athletes don't wear athletic apparel, uh, to class, right? Because they, they may get that question. Uh, based on what they're wearing, right? Which again is not fair to athletes in general, um, right? Uh, but anyway, going back to the example, can I touch your hair? Again, very racialized statement. Uh, and again, it, it, it in some cases, for instance, can I touch your hair? It's not necessarily an Ill, an Ill intentioned statement, right? Like you're not you're not necessarily putting that person's down person down. What you are doing is you're putting them in a category of other. And you're making it very clear that they're different from you or that they're exotic in comparison to you. Um, and so that is really the microaggression there, right? But, and that's again where this concept of intent versus impact becomes very important, uh, where the intention may be an honest curiosity, right? Maybe an honest curiosity, uh, but it's not just, uh, but, but of course it, it comes off as very insulting. You're putting that person in, in the category of other. And yeah, someone here is writing in that these examples uh, of racism, the racism doesn't exist only in, uh, and, well, two statements that I want to read out. So you guys are really good today with the comments. Um, so the first one is uh, to clarify that, that racism doesn't happen only in the US. It's, it's a global thing. And absolutely, uh, all of these things are, are, are global in nature. We used primarily US examples, but not exclusively. I think a lot of these do happen in other places. Those so stereotypes around women and race, absolutely, those are global in nature. Uh, someone else is writing in, um, let me just read the full comment. Uh, yes, um, so the statement about, about the hair, right? So in addition to putting that person in the category of other, it's also wildly uncomfortable. Um, it's uncomfortable, ju just to be clear, it's uncomfortable even reading it out loud. Uh, right, because especially if it's someone you don't know, you're you're you're, you're violating that person's personal space, uh, and, and and it's it, again, it's 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 very um, it's a very strange thing to ask someone, but it is a thing that happens. Uh, so it's it's important to know that, right? Uh, so let's move forward. I think I think we all understand what we're talking about here, but it, it's important to make sure that we're really clear. On, one, what are microaggressions? And two, to just raise awareness of how innocent some of them can seem, right? So for instance, you saying, sorry, I just had an OCD moment. It's such an innocent statement, right? Or, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just being a little ADD, right? When you're trying to say that you're you're distracted easily or you're not paying attention. They're not particularly, they don't seem like very harmful statements. But if you say that to someone who does have who actually has OCD and who has to take prescriptions for it and, and for whom it has made a significant impact on their lives. Yes, it is a very um, 
difficult statement for them to hear and to deal with because you're you're making light of something that to them is important right so so that's really the point and the big takeaway from all this and now what we're going to do is we're actually going to move into now that we understand what microaggressions are and i think we're all very very clear and i'm gonna i'm done now with the very awkward job of having to sit here and read out loud uh, random microaggressions um which by the way is wildly uncomfortable i'm going to pass it over now to natalie who's going to take us into what resources and what um, strategies you can employ to overcome uh, microaggressions. So Natalie, take it away. Hi, uh, thank you. So uh, I just wanted to say a, a couple of things because I saw someone else write in about the audio. And um, I know sometimes we have had more success, especially when um, the webinar gets more crowded. If you dial in on your phone, um, so I can't remember if Jorge mentioned that earlier, but if you missed that point and you're having some audio issues, feel free to try coming in on your phone and, and the connection might be a little better. Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to say before we dive into this section, and maybe it's a good segue, um, is back to Jorge's point about Black History Month, since obviously neither one of us is Black, mm -hmm. we can offer specific nuance or, you know, personal insight into the examples that we provide or the content in this webinar, but we did want to just sort of um, make a nod to the fact that it is Black History Month and, and make some racialized examples more central to this presentation. So thank you for that. But of course, as the comments have already um, indicated, we, we are, you know, come at this from a U.S. perspective. So it's really great when you write in and you um, add that nuance of what the global experience has looked like or what this looks like in a different um, cultural context or national context. So we appreciate those and it, it always makes the conversation more interesting. Um, but of course, like Jorge said, there's um, there, there are global patterns, right? Some of these things pop up all over the place um, when it comes to the issue of uh, how black hair is policed. I know uh, when I was living in Cote d'Ivoire in West Africa for a while, um, there was a, a pattern of uh, women that I befriended or spoke to who talked about their experience of wearing different hairstyles in the workplace. And even there, there was um, there was like this normalization of um, wearing weaves and having, you know, smooth, white presenting hair um, that was still glamorized um, in, in a cultural sense, even though, you know, Cote d'Ivoire is a Black country um, in a very different context than the demographics we have in the U.S. So um, there, there are, you know, different elements at play, and sometimes there's a global pattern, and sometimes it can be very uh, individual and context specific. But please keep writing in. I, I really enjoy uh, I think both of us really like when there's the that engagement. Okay, um, so we're gonna move into what you can do about this. So the first slide that we have up here is difficult conversations. And really what that means is how do we how do we think about broaching a conversation that where a microaggression has already happened, something non-inclusive or you know, prejudicial has popped up and now it's like right in front of us, and what do we do? Um and we, we, we're not going to dive into, ex you know, the specifics of how to navigate that conversation, but the principle that we really try to reinforce is trust intentions and name impact. Um, and so what that means is we all have good intentions, right? We, we walk through the world thinking that, you know, we want to do good. We trust other people to want to be nice and to generally do good in the world. Um, but that doesn't mean that we always have a positive impact. Those are two completely different things. And having a negative impact um, is not an indictment of character. It doesn't it doesn't mean that um, you know you're a bad person. It's not attached to necessarily something more significant, but it does mean that we need to be accountable for the action that we took and the learning process of not doing it again. Um, so we really reinforce that when if someone brings a microaggression to your attention um, to, you know, you can apologize for having done it, but make sure you're really focused on listening to their perspective. You're, you don't get focused on um, defensiveness or trying to explain yourself, because a lot of times we instinctively want to explain our good intentions when in reality it's it's most constructive and reparative to move forward if you just apologize 
for the impact that you had. Um, so that's really what, what we want to emphasize here. And <clears throat> on the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit more about how to kind of avoid microaggressions in the first place. So we, we use the pause reflect model in a number of our courses because it's, it's essentially just a way of slowing your brain down, right? In, when we have unconscious bias, in our minds really what that means is that our brain is constantly taking shortcuts and we're using all of these patterns and similarities that we have identified over the course of our lifetimes or that we've been taught over the course of our lifetimes to make these instant decisions but what that means is that sometimes we're not thinking about why we're making the decisions why we're saying the things that we are why we're interacting with colleagues in the way that we are um so it's really valuable to simply slow down. So the pause reflect model is really just a, a way of describing how to slow down. Um, and and the, fir the first one is just to pause, just to take a moment and stop yourself from focusing on anything else. Don't rush yourself into making a decision. This can be related to processes like you know hiring and recruitment, but it can also just be in the moment of a conversation, taking a moment to reflect before you react to something or before you make a joke um, and think about what the options are, right? Think about what it is that you want to say, what's motivating you, um, what you could possibly do differently if you don't feel like your motivation or like the impact is going to be what you want. Um, and then you make your decision, right? And then you take action. Um, so again, it's really just a way of outlining the process of pausing, taking a moment to, you know, think and evaluate, and then move forward from there. Um, and you'll find that as you learn more about inclusion and more about the specific ways that bias pops up, um, you'll be able to attach these, uh, your decisions to um, more inclusive behaviors, right? You'll begin to identify where these, um, maybe problem areas are popping up for you or what kind of mistakes you have made in the past that you want to improve on. Um, and so with practice, the pause reflect model actually becomes more and more useful, right? Because you get better and better at slowing down, you get more comfortable slowing down, and you also get better at monitoring yourself and identifying the areas where um, you have room for growth. So these are strategies for um, just, you know, individually um, things to focus on in order to try and avoid or, or um, uh, hold yourself accountable. Um, and in the next section, we're actually going to talk a little bit more big picture about allyship. So an ally is a person who actively promotes and aspires to advance a culture of inclusion through intentional, positive, and conscious efforts that benefit people as a whole. This is a quote from Sheree Atchison. We use this in um in one of our inclusion courses and it i really like it because it emphasizes the fact that allyship doesn't just happen right you don't just like set out with your good intentions and claim to be an ally because you have those good intentions it really requires a, a you know intentional effort to learn about inclusion to um, practice inclusion to make behavioral changes that have uh, an impact on, you know, your own life, but also on your interactions with your coworkers. Um, so we try to be um, as clear about that as possible, because it's very easy to slip into this mode of allyship, like Oh, I've you know I'm I've started learning, and so I you know I want to act as an ally. Um, but we we need to be really careful about how we use that term because it, it's not it's not something that you can just claim for yourself, right? It, it does require that that constant learning curve. So we're going to outline a little bit what this looks like in practice. We define allyship kind of in four different categories. Um, that's going to show up on the next slide. So I'm just going to walk through what the four categories are, and then um, and then we'll do a little bit of an activity about how this relates to microaggressions. So the first one is the amplifier. This um, is someone who strives to make sure that um, excluded or marginalized voices are being heard, right? That they're given true space. So let's say in a meeting, somebody 
gets interrupted or their idea gets sort of pushed to the side and you might an amplifier might you know raise their speak up raise their hand and say hey um i noticed that when jana was speaking we got sidetracked and i really want to return to what she was saying or i think this was a great idea that janet had let's give her the floor um and then janet can take center stage and she can share her idea and not you know hopefully not be talked over or interrupted or dismissed um and rem just bearing in mind that the amplifier role is exactly that right it's about amplifying someone else um it's not about taking center stage yourself and you're going to notice that pattern pop up as i describe these allyship roles we never want to be taking center stage away from the person who's experienced a microaggression or someone from a marginalized group um that is actually the, the very opposite of what we want um but this this amplifier role really just like passes the mic right um a supporter is someone who essentially um, makes sure that other people are okay, that we're tapping into how people feel, whether they feel valued, feel included, or, or supported in their environment. So um, this might pop up, let's say, if someone experiences a microaggression, um, and after the fact, let's say you witness it, maybe didn't think it was appropriate to, to interrupt the interaction, but afterward you might say, hey, I noticed that this happened. Are you feeling okay? um do, you know is there anything i can offer you did you want to talk about it um and the answer can always be no right and the there we're never forcing anyone we don't want to force anyone to have an interaction or to you know walk through a painful experience if they don't want to share um but a supportive role can really just be an act of saying hey i'm here if you need it um and so this is really about active listening, right? The ability to just sort of sit with someone else's perspective, center, um, center, you know, their perspective and their needs in that moment. Um, so just listen to understand more so than listening to respond, right? Uh, the researcher is what everybody is doing right now in this webinar. Um, the researcher <laughs> is someone who's doing their homework. Uh, and it, it really is about a proactive learning process. Um, so like we said in, you know, when I first defined allyship, it takes this conscious effort, right? And part of that is that there are a lot of terms and concepts and practices that are foreign to people or that are always evolving, right? Um, and we're constantly also learning about ourselves and trying to connect those ideas with our own life experience. So there's a there is a constant sort of learning curve that we return to and that we talk about in DE and I. Um, and the researcher is somebody who uh, it, you know takes on that learning process for themselves, right? Let's say that there's something in this webinar that you're you know we're unaware of or that feels foreign to you. Um, maybe you go online and you know research it after the fact. Um, and the the reason that this can be an act of allyship is not just that it you know gives you more exposure to uh, ideas around equity and inclusion, but also that it takes the onus off of marginalized groups to share that information or to explain themselves or to justify their their perspective and their experiences, right? Um, so if someone has just experienced a microaggression, they might, they're probably not going to want to explain to you why it was a problem, right? Um, for them. So you might want to, being the researcher can really just be about privately being accountable for your own learning um, and not, you know, putting the onus on someone else to assist you in that process. And you can always ask for help. There's always resources available, right? It's not that you can't ever <laughs> ask questions, um, but when possible, taking on this role um, can be really valuable. And it can also give you the advantage of learning in your own space, right? Just being um, comfortable and being able to uh, absorb the information at your own pace and in, and in a context that feels comfortable. So uh, the last one is the intervener, and this is someone who vocally and <laughs> visibly uh, challenges non-inclusive behaviors or policies. And this one can be a tricky one because, like I said before, we never want to be taking center stage when we're, you know, trying to be an ally. Uh, so the intervening is very context specific. Um, so this, but this might happen in the moment that an issue arises. Let's say you witness a microaggression um, and if appropriate, 
you might, you know, talk about, you might interrupt the scene and say, hey, um, I don't think that's an appropriate comment or, you know, like if someone like, hey, I noticed you interrupted Janet when she was sharing her idea in the meeting, please don't do that and let's, you know, get back to it. So the intervener sort of like names an issue and, and calls attention to the fact that something non-inclusive has happened or that a microaggression has happened. Um, and in an attempt to to create accountability and and to move forward uh, to sort of alter course course correct, um, so just but again keep in mind that these all of these are sort of interconnected and fluid. You're never just going to be one type of ally. Um, I constantly it's we we move in and out of these roles at, situationally and. Um, this is just this model or these these four categories are intended to give you a sense of what is possible and how these things might play out um but it's never it's it's of course not not black and white so now we are going to do an activity um where we look at how these roles might play out in relation to an example so we have a really common microaggression at the top of the screen here what are you and this this is again I, I understand what jorge was saying because i hate reading them out loud um it's really but awkward it really yeah it yeah, feels it's... really unpleasant so uh but this comes from it's similar to uh where are you really from right but it, uh, even more dehumanizing right just asking what are you as if just you know not a human in front of us um and so what we want to ask you to do is share uh, in the comment section, just write in what you think um, an ally could do if you were to witness this microaggression happening between um, between two colleagues. So we'll give you a moment to write yeah. into that e-questions box and share what you think an ally could do. And you can attach it to one of the four roles. We're going to go over four different strategies. Um, but you you can you know write in what feels comfortable for you or what you think uh, would be a good a good act of allyship in this moment. And by the way, while you're writing in the comments, um, and I see a couple of them already coming in, uh, but while you're writing in your comments, it, it is you know I really want to stress the point that when when you are uh, being an ally for someone, and, th and this really is kind of one of one of the key uh, responses to, to any sort of microaggression, it's it's so important. To um, to do so with humility, right, and to not act without at least understanding what the aggrieved person would sort of um, want you to do, or about trying to put yourself in that person's shoes, right? Don't essentially don't make it be about yourself, right? Because I think a lot of people do that. Now we've got some comments coming in, so I'll read them out for you there, Natalie, um, and let you speak to them a bit. So so first one of them is saying very clearly just saying you know speak up uh which you know to me kind of sounds like a classic sort of intervener approach um some of these a little bit more nuanced so let's see um uh ask the question oh oh so many comments sorry ask the question to the person asking what do you want to know right so i think that's another way of asking someone else just wrote in as well why do you ask so i think those are also two separate types of of of, of, of intervener sort of behaviors um coming up to them afterwards and call them in a conversation and inform them how that can be offensive okay so so call it out to them separately and individually uh depending on the environment you can speak up directly to the aggressor and try to help rephrase so we've got a lot of interveners here rephrase your true meaning or check with the receiver of the aggression letting them know that you saw and heard what happened and offer help right so that's that's a little bit more of a um a supporter type role um okay so intervention typically happens through courageous conversations and sometimes you are intervening up behalf, on behalf of yourself absolutely uh, i'd be a strong intervener for making uh and, and uh, for making the other person feel ashamed uh or or to make uh the microaggressor recognize that they've done something wrong so some really great responses here i think again a lot of people uh, coming at it from the intervener standpoint, I would I would only because I know Natalie in a minute you're going to show some of the other responses, but it's not always possible to be an intervener. Um, so I do just want to, and I, I say that as someone typically 
and Natalie can attest to this and anyone from RW3 who's listening in, in probably knows this, I typically stray to the side of intervener as well. I tend to just be like, all right, well, you know, that, that was a stupid thing to say. What were you trying to say? Um, which is not at all the recommended approach. Uh, but that's <laughs> probably what I would do. Um, so, so, but that's not always the best approach, right? So, so, so sometimes there are situations in which maybe you can't be so upfront, right? Whether, um, because the person who made the microaggression may be in a more senior role. And so therefore you have to go about it in a slightly different way, uh, right? But there are some situations in which may not be, um, uh, may not be as, as easy, right? Someone else writing in as well that they're also, um, they do also intervene whenever they witness a microaggression and finding the appropriate ways and times. So having said that, Natalie, because uh, there's still comments coming in, but let me kick it back to you. I'm going to be quiet now uh, and let you uh, continue with the slide. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so I, I really appreciate and actually I kind of like that there are so many interveners in here. It's very rare. Usually you don't see that many interveners, but this yeah. we had a lot. <laughs> yeah. Fun. Um, okay, so um, we'll walk through. I'll get. I'll, we'll circle back to the intervener because it, it is a really interesting, um, an interesting role. And someone wrote in a comment that I definitely want to reply to. But I'll walk through these first. So the amplifier um, is uh, the the one that we came up with is notify your supervisor, uh, and that is of course only with the consent of the aggrieved party. Um, so that, that if you witness this happening, and then after the fact, you say, "Hey, I noticed that this person, you know, committed a microaggression, and I it made me uncomfortable. How are you feeling? What is there anything that you want me to do for you, or do you think that this is something you want to bring to?" uh the supervisor and that you want to have that conversation first because otherwise we enter into this place of again sort of like uh, and in this case metaphorically taking the mic away from someone else right ultimately the person who received the microaggression gets to decide how they want to act um and any of these actions that an ally might take in that situation are designed to support the person in their their response right um so that that is one way that the amplifier can just say, hey, I want to make sure that you like your perspective in this is heard. So just be aware that, you know, taking this to the supervisor could be an option. Um, the supporter, uh, again, and this typically just happens in the form of a conversation, right? Um, but the supporter might just ask, you know, is there anything I can do? I noticed that this happened. That was really crummy. Um, do you want to talk about it? Um, and that is is typically the case. The more personal of a of a relationship you have with the person the the more variation there might be in a supporter role right um because if you know the person better you might know best how they like to receive support um but this this one is pretty pretty straightforward and then the researcher um, might try to understand like if you witness this interaction and you're like mm, there was some tension here or maybe the person who received the microaggression responded and said hey uh, that's really not appropriate or why are you asking that um uh we would want to not you know if we need to do that learning on our own um you would be a good idea to go and do that research without, you know, putting again more onus on the person who has just been microaggressed to explain themselves or to do more work of explaining it to you. You could go um, and learn about it yourself. Or maybe uh, if you're the person who committed the microaggression and you, uh, someone calls you on it rather than, you know, arguing with them or asking them questions or, um, you know, kind of pushing them to do the work of teaching you in that moment, you could just say, hey, um, I'm, you know what? Thank you for telling me. I'm really sorry. And I am, you know, going to go learn about how to do this differently. Um, so, the last one again is the intervener um, and I'm going to rush through because I, I don't want to <laughs> take up too much more time. Um, but, it, you know, you could say that's not an appropriate question. Many of you wrote in with other great responses um, The one person said, I'm curious and a natural researcher, but witnessing a microaggression. Uh, I tend to be an intervener um, and finding the appropriate way or time to intervene is sometimes hard to navigate. Um, so the one thing that I will say is in this situation, it's usually best to just uh, observe and then defer to the person who has experienced the 
the microaggression, right? They are going to be your best indicator of what is and is not appropriate. If you know them really well, maybe you have a conversation with them. I actually used to be a bartender. I had a colleague who would have these kinds of issues. Um, and because she was a black woman and we worked together um, and so she would get comments from customers sometimes who just said really you know gross ugly things um and sometimes i would i would just go to her and ask i'd say hey do you want to talk to the supervisor about this do you want me to talk to the guest about this is there anything that you need um and the better i got to know her the the more comfortable i felt if i witnessed something happening i knew what she would be comfortable with me saying to another guest um but that took time right so this i thank you for saying that um it is hard to navigate and sometimes it takes time but the best thing is is really to defer to the person who um who should be central um whose perspective we want to prioritize okay i'm going to be quiet now thank you very very much i will pass it back to jorge <laughs> Thank you, Natalie, and, and thank you everyone so far. So let's move into, because we still have a little bit more to cover. So let's move into what you can do as an individual and of course, what you can do for your organizations, right? So as an individual, um, focus on impact, right? If someone calls out a microaggression, focus on impact. Don't try to explain what you did. It doesn't matter, right? Um, it might matter in the sense that, okay, you're a better person because you weren't trying to be malicious, but you still hurt someone's feelings, you still did something wrong, so apologize and, and acknowledge the impact of what you did and then learn from it. Um, and it's not easy, by the way, right? Going back to the humility statement, that's not, it's way easier to say that than to actually do it. Um, so if you have a hard time of it, it's fine. It doesn't make you a bad person. It's actually, it's human nature uh, to have a hard time with that. We don't like to acknowledge when we're wrong. Um, the next one, master that pause reflect model, right? That ability to slow down before you make a decision master that really really understand that um be an ally right so we just showed you multiple ways of being an ally it's very simple and none of them have to do with putting on a t-shirt that says i am an ally of this cause right you don't have to go out and change everything about who you are in order to be an ally allies typically uh act in small moments right and we're talking about small microaggressions they act in small moments Right? So always keep that in mind. And then understand difficult conversations, understand curiosity conversations, know how to ask questions, know how to challenge something that maybe just seems wrong. Uh, so, so, so know how to do that in a way that isn't like, you know, hey, that wasn't right. Um, right? Something that's a little bit more uh, uh, likely to, to, to change behavior in the long run, right? And not quite so combative. So the next one, um, for your organizations, right? For those of you who are here as practitioners of DEI, and I know that's the majority of you. Uh, first of all, establish clear procedures. So in other words, make sure that everyone knows what the rules are within the organization. Everyone knows what to do if they do see a behavior that is out of line, right? So understand that and make sure that you have the right policies in place. Um, make sure this is not like a plug to RW3. Ideally, it's with RW3, but it can be with anyone. You can go out and create training yourself, but give training to your leadership, also give training to your middle managers. That is the biggest thing that always goes um, sort of unnoticed is middle managers are the real sort of power brokers in many organizations when it comes to the success or failure of DEI policies. So make sure that they, and if you are on this call and you are a middle manager, please listen to that. That buy-in is very, very important right? Uh, because they are the ones that can make these policies and make these initiatives move forward, or they're the ones that can make them become stagnant if they're not bought in and if the communication to them isn't, isn't quite right. Uh, ensure that your know, company policies are prioritizing equity and inclusion, right? And there's many different ways to do that. We can, we can have a whole separate conversation about that, but for now, just always have that in the back of your mind. And there are small things like having family leave, having paid family leave, right? And not, not, oh, not just giving the bare minimum. Um, being flexible with work arrangements, things like that. Uh, and then lastly, encourage employees to provide feedback. And you can you can do that. I know people laugh when they hear the term safe space, but you can do that in a safe space. You can do that anonymously, however it is, but get feedback, right? Especially, I, I mentioned before, middle managers. If that is a challenge that you're having, you're not really going to know about it because your middle manager is going to tell you, oh, yeah, yeah, we're doing all the things you told us to do. Uh, so make sure that you are actually speaking to your people on the ground and getting as much feedback as you can so on that note let me um let me jump on over here to the platform i know we only have like a minute or two uh but 
I want to jump over to the platform because we've been talking around it. Uh, so I want to just show you a couple of the courses that we've been drawing from for today's call. Uh, so we have uh, a few different resources here on the Culture Wizard site, right? We have the Global Inclusion course, we have our course on Overcoming Implicit Bias, et cetera. We have our Microaggressions course. So most of the content that we drew upon today came directly from the Microaggressions course. Um, and the Microaggressions course really kind of explains, defines microaggressions, it shows folks uh, what they can do um, to to overcome or to if, if they've experienced a microaggression, if they've been the victim of microaggression, et cetera, all right, and really kind of provides best practices for the individuals when they are dealing with microaggressions in the workplace. Uh, in addition to that, we have, I mentioned our global inclusion course, wherein we have our global inclusion assessment. Uh, that assessment measures each individual's capacity for inclusion right so it's not sentiment analysis there's a lot of that out there this is not that this is really looking at behavior uh, and showing us what is this person's behavior like when it comes to, to inclusion and, and uh, is this person a, or am i right it's not looking at it you're not looking at their score the individual is finding out am i an inclusive person and if it's not right what can I do to improve, right? It provides very practical and easy recommendations for what they can do uh, to improve. So again, if you are a client of RW3, you would like to add this into your, um, your, your, your content library, reach out to us right here on the questions box or reach out to your client service manager um, and we will reach out. If you are not a client of RW3, but you would like, you're considering this, uh, feel free to reach out uh, for trial access and we'll be more than happy to give you access to this um, platform so you can have the assessment you can have the courses with the assessment we can also talk about um, putting together sort of a company report for you as well uh, and analyzing that and giving you recommendations uh, on, on what you can do uh, to to improve as an organization and to grow as an organization of course respecting everyone's privacy so that's absolutely something that that we can do we have other resources as well like our racial and ethnic bias course uh, from which we also drew some content uh, for some of the examples that we gave and things like that and of course we have a variety of different games and other learning experiences and we do have this new course coming out on neurodiversity in the workplace um, in uh, just a couple of, of months uh, so if you are interested in any of, of the content, feel free to, again, write that into the questions box and we will set you up with a trial access to it uh, or reach out to you otherwise. Uh, and in the meantime, thank you all so much for your time today. We made it in just under a minute to go. So we're there. Um, Natalie, thank you so much uh, for, for, um, for, for participating as always. And of course, thank you all of you for joining today's call. Again, a few of you are writing in asking for trial access already. So if you are interested, uh, please feel free to write that in. Uh, otherwise, we will also reach out uh, as well. Uh, and we will send you the recording uh, later, uh, or sorry, early next week. Uh, so you'll have that available for you as well. So thank you all so much again. Uh, Natalie, thank you. And uh, we'll be... We'll be uh, hearing from you soon, I hope. All right, thank you all very much. And um, I hope that these resources helped you and you, you're able to, to take them with you.